video taken on the northern uh, part of the Great Barrier Reef where um, they had some of the most severe bleaching. And you can see some corals are still healthy. The white ones are pretty much bleached, but they're still alive. Some of them still have a little coral and you sometimes see a little fluorescence. Sometimes these corals uh, produce fluorescent proteins when they're bleached and they're actually quite beautiful and sort of ghost-like when they, they're some of those purples and pinks there you can see. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Joni Kleipas thinks a lot about the ocean, about coral reefs, and about climate change. She has worked on coral reefs for more than 30 years trying to understand how climate change and ocean acidification will shape the future of coral reefs. And she's been an extremely valuable scientific advisor to our work here on climate communication as part of the National Network on Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation. Um, she's helped bring a scientific perspective to our work and also really help us understand how even, and even especially for scientists and ecologists, hope is really important. Joni has worked for years with oceanographic modelers to understand climate refugia for coral populations and where they might be. She continues to pursue that work, but the refugia are getting smaller, and it's clear that the traditional ways to conserve coral reefs will not be enough. So recently, Joni started an active reef restoration project on the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. She's found that getting back in the water has been a very positive and practical way to work on solutions for coral reefs. And it's also proving to be a surprisingly effective way to communicate about climate change with the public. So please join me in welcoming Joni. I'm going to give a, a kind of a weird title here, but I do want to say, yes, you, when you get in the water and work with corals, you do fall in love with them. And that's sort of the theme of my talk. But I want to give you a, a question of where, you know, start with the big picture first the really big picture. And so uh, this is a picture that was taken from Saturn by the Cassini satellite. And this is Earth, right? That's amazing. It's blue. That far out, it's blue. It's not red. It's not white. It's blue. I think that is a remarkable thing. And this is it blown up. <coughs> That's the Earth, it's blue, and that's the moon, which is not so blue. Let me see if I get back away from this. I don't need to be there. Uh, so the first thing that you have to do to fall in love with life on the planet is fall in love with the planet itself. It's gorgeous. And it also gives me an opportunity to say Happy World Ocean Day. It was last weekend. But I, I know that there were probably a lot of cool stuff going on here, and I didn't get to participate. So now I just sort of extend it a little bit and say, Happy World Oceans Day. Important day for the planet. So I like to show this because it also reinforces the idea that the planet is a blue planet. And it's a blue planet because there's so much water. But I can tell you that anybody that's looking at the globe right here is going to look at it, and the first thing they're going to look at is the land, right? So you can say, oh, there's Boston. Nope, that's not Boston. There it is, right there, right? That's the first thing people do. They don't think about the water. They don't think about the oceans. We're terrestrial. We're not marine, and so we don't think about the oceans very much, but they're really important. The second thing I want to point out is right on the edge, if you can see this um, really, really thin layer of our atmosphere, it is very thin. Most of the world's atmosphere is about 10 kilometers thick. That's not that thick. It go, extends far beyond that, but the bulk of it is really pretty thin. And it's the same way with the depth of the oceans. The depth of the oceans are uh, really at its deepest point, just a little bit more than 10K. If you could run and not worry about the pressure, you could run 10K and reach the bottom of the ocean. That's, that's not much at all, right? So it, it makes you realize how fragile the system is. And when you take all the water and the atmosphere off the planet, you end up with just this much water. This is all of the water. This is the water that's, I believe, in lakes and 
uh, in uh, groundwater, and then this would be lakes and streams. So if you just fold them all up in a little ball, it's not very much. The fragile planet, this is the atmosphere by comparison. And so when we think about the oceans, it's kind of uh, not surprising that we have problems like ocean warming with this thin layer around the Earth, ocean acidification, and ocean deoxygenation. And I'm not going to talk about all those, but those three big things are happening in the oceans right now. And it's because it's a thin layer, and the actions that we do to change the atmosphere are um, impacting the ocean as well. I'm going to focus mostly on global warming. But first, um, you guys probably don't need to see this, but I'm just sort of going through a scroll of things about why the biology in the ocean is so amazing. I started with single cells, and then this is going to progress to the largest animal in the ocean. You're here at the aquarium. You see all the fascinating things. So probably don't need to go through this. But it is just a reminder that this is a freaking amazing place, right? The oceans. There are so many creatures and so many different life forms. It's, it's incredibly inspiring to think about it um, and their intelligence as well. And so I think I'm getting close to the end. But you guys, the aquarium represents most of these animals, except the whales. And it is, it's kind of humbling when you think about it, how long it took for all of these organisms to evolve and become part of the planet. And the thing that I really love, the organism that's really gotten into my heart lately, even though I worked on them a long time, I kind of worked on them through computers, so I forgot how really cool they are, are corals. So this is a, a, a close-up of one of the corals that we're growing in our nurseries. And if you're not familiar, there's you can see the white skeleton that it produces underneath. But each one of these little tiny dots in here is a coral polyp surrounded by tentacles. And they're animals, in case you didn't know that. I think anybody that braved the uh, weather to come out here tonight probably knows a lot of these things already. But uh, the, the remarkable part of these coral polyps is, uh, and corals in general, what makes them so successful they evolved 240 million years ago in the Triassic, and they've been with us ever since and have survived so many ups and downs in climate change. They're pretty incredible creatures. Um, but what makes them so successful are these little brown um, unicellular uh, algae that live in its tissues. We call them zooxanthellae, but I'll just refer to them as symbiotic algae. The algae produce a lot of nutri nutrition for the coral, uh, and the coral, in turn, provides it with products that the algae can use to grow. So it's a nice relationship. These corals can grow in places where there's very low nutrients because of it, and they are, they're pretty tough. It's kind of like us, if we could engineer our skin to have algae growing in our skin, we could go outside and sunbathe and not have to eat very much. So that would be kind of a cool genetic engineering challenge, right? I think, we, and then think of all the colors we could be. That would be really cool too. <laughs> so, this is a, uh, the secret to why corals are so amazing. The other thing that people don't realize is that yes, they are animals. They have sex lives. They have, you know, uh, life cycles that are very complex. And this is a movie of baby corals that have come out of the water column and settled onto some coral and algae. And aren't they cute? <laughs> Look at them, right? They are looking for a place to, to find a place on this, this substrate, wiggle in, cement themselves down, and then they grow, grow into a new coral. It's really uh, pretty cool, particularly that last little guy that kind of shoved his brother out of the way. <laughs> The other cool part about reefs, if you spend enough time on them, or if you put hydrophones down, they're really, there's a lot of noise. So if we, you walk through a rainforest, there's a lot of noise. There's birds, there's locusts, there's, there's just a ton of things, monkeys, things, things making lots of noise. Reefs are just as biodiverse as, as rainforests. 
and they have just as many sounds. We just can't hear them all. But when people do uh, play the sounds from these hydrophones, I'm going to play this in a minute, just close your eyes and see what you can hear. Mostly you're going to hear something that sounds like frying eggs, right? Mm -hmm. Those are just little shrimp that make this popping sound with their, with their claws like this. But the rest you're going to hear grunts and purrs and a few other things. And see, just see what you can hear. I won't pl play the whole thing. cool, huh? Right? And so uh, they're actually, they, they realize when they put these hydrophones on a reef uh, before dawn, they actually have a morning chorus similar to what you have with the birds outside your window. So certain things start up and then something else chimes in and then later and later. So you know these things are all interacting. There's a communication going on and we just were never aware of it until we started putting in these hydrophones to actually listen for these sounds. People are starting to figure out who's making those sounds, uh, but uh, it's, it's still kind of an open field right now and a new emerging field. When they put these hydrophones on a healthy reef like that, they see a lot of, uh, they hear a lot of sounds. When you put it on a, a reef that's damaged, you hear much less. So it's, it's uh, an indicator as well. So what are coral reefs? Well, I used to work on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, which is this beautiful ribbon of corals that you, uh, coral reefs that you can see here from satellite. Um, that's a closer view here. And that's what it looks like when you fly over them. And they're, if you've not seen reefs like this, they're pretty spectacular to dive on. They're just endless um, depths and, and expanses and variety of corals. They're really almost undescribable until you go there. How many people have seen the movie Chasing Coral in here? That's a good number of you. They did a really great job of documenting a lot of the, the reefs on the Great Barrier Reef during the last coral bleaching event. So uh, there are reefs in a lot of places in the world. A lot of people that don't realize that they occur here off of Africa, um, even in southern parts of Africa. This side of Australia is often the neglected side in terms of reefs and even along this uh, west coast here. So a lot of the work I do is on coral modeling. I, as, as Billy said, I tried uh, hard for uh, most of my career to use really high resolution um, oceanographic models to find places where coral reefs were going to survive into the future. If we knew that, we can put our efforts there and keep those reefs around. Who are most likely to succeed? Um, and we're just continuing to work there at finer and finer scales. Um, but now, I went on the other side of the ocean and I'm working over here in Costa Rica. So, I don't know why, <laughs> I'm a little bit stupid. I think this is the highest biodiversity you can imagine. It's incredible marine biodiversity. It is the, the, the most biodiverse place in the ocean and perhaps on the planet. And this has really low biodiversity. These are your lowest biodiversity reefs. So I'm working in both, both um, extremes. OK, so the second thing you need to do if we want to fall in love with a, with a coral is you have to acknowledge that they're having problems. So most of these problems fall into three camps, pollution, climate change, and exploitation. So with each one of those, there's a lot of different pieces to that. I tend to focus on climate change. That's what I do where I work. Um, but these other two issues are ongoing. And those are things that we can control pretty readily. The climate change part is a little bit tougher. I'm going to focus on temperature. And I'm going to focus on coral bleaching. Most of you are familiar with coral bleaching, I think. I will give a brief explanation of it. But coral bleaching can change a beautiful reef like this into corals which have lost their symbiotic algae and are paled, like in this picture. And if those corals die and the reef is not reseeded with those little larvae, then you can end up with an eroded reef that becomes something like that. 
That's a really sad thing. We want to avoid this in our oceans. We're losing a lot of corals. We've already lost about half of them in the planet. And to prevent this, there are things that we're going to need to do. So this is due mainly to warming of the Earth's surface. So you've seen graphs like this before. This is um, how much temperature has gone up based on this baseline of 1960s through the 1990s. This is the baseline temperature we're comparing. Before then, the oceans were cooler, and now the oceans are warmer than that period of time. And the black line, this, the, these red and blue lines are global temperatures. The black line is the temperature of the tropical oceans where corals live. So it's really pretty much mirrors what's happening on the globe. It's a little bit less severe. But one of the interesting parts of that is that those three arrows show when we have major global coral bleaching events. So these are the three times. It happens to coincide with El Nino years. I think it's 97, 98. I think that's 2012. Um, no, I can't remember 2000. One, these are um, the last few years, tw 2014 through 2017, mainly 2016. This was a whopper. A lot of corals uh, bleached on reefs all over the world. So this is just an example of what a really healthy coral looks like. It's got all of its algae. It's looking good and it's feeling good. This one has lost, these corals have lost their symbiotic algae. They're not dead. They can recover, they can get those algae back and get their color back and, and survive. But about, um, depends on how hot the temperatures are, but quite often they will die. Um, and I'll show some examples of that. Uh, one thing that we talk about to describe what's happening to corals, the way we measure how stressed they are by temperature change is something we call degree heating week. This is a lot like a drought index. So it's very similar to, say, when you've got um, a heat wave that comes through your city. You can handle a day or two of really you know, hot temperatures, temperatures over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But if it goes on for weeks, you tend to get pretty stressed out. And that's the same thing that happens to the corals. So usually we use an index that covers 12 weeks total. The, if, for example, if the coral it has uh, experience of uh, one degree above what it normally feels for three weeks, and that's a degree heating week of three, then maybe the temperature goes back down. So it doesn't accumulate any degree heating weeks. And then the temperature shoots back up to two degrees above normal for four weeks, and that gives it a eight. We add those three together, that's a degree heating week of 11 for the past three months of that coral. That's, that's a nasty degree heating week. That will end up in a coral being severely bleached. Once they, they can handle three or four degree heating weeks, uh, but once they get over that, they start to bleach. And once they get over eight degree heating weeks, they tend to severely bleach. And it makes it harder for them to recover. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the last time we had a big global scale coral bleaching event was in, started in 2014, and it ended in 2017, and it affected reefs all over the world. This is an example of a video taken on the northern uh, part of the Great Barrier Reef where um, they had some of the most severe bleaching. And you can see some corals are still healthy, the white ones are pretty much bleached, but they're still alive. Some of them still have a little coral, and you sometimes see a little fluorescence. Sometimes these corals uh, produce fluorescent proteins when they're bleached, and then they're actually quite beautiful and sort of ghost-like when they, they're some of those purples and pinks there, you can see. So this is um, pretty severe bleaching probably most of these corals died. And then in the end, you'll see that this is just the one of the survey tapes 
that scientists laid out to sort of document the extent of the bleaching. So this is what happened on the northern Great Barrier Reef. We had these degree heating weeks that were really high in this part, in the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef, moderate in the central part, and cooled off thanks to a hurricane that came through and cooled off the waters down here. Those were spared from the warming waters, but we had really high levels of mortality. 50% of the corals here died, 30% here, 20 here, and almost nothing in the Southern Great Barrier Reef. The problem that happened was the next year they bleached again. So they had two back-to-back -back years of bleaching, and a lot of the corals died. And this has been a huge impact on the Great Barrier Reef. So I often play music in my talks, but since this is a uh, widecast, I can't, or um, webcast, I can't really play it. But I'll go ahead and put the music up there, because when I hear this song, I think about coral reefs rather than my old boyfriend. So. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants to sing it, you're more than welcome. If anybody has a good voice, uh, I think you might all be familiar with this. But it basically, you know, look at the reef sometimes feels like it's crying out. Look at me now, right? I'm just an empty space. There's nothing left to remind me of the memory of, I changed the word, this place. But take a look at me now. Um, it's just an empty space and you're coming back to me is against the odds, but that's a chance I gotta take, okay? That's what we have to do. We have to hang on like Phil Collins did, right? For that person to come back. The, the situation is pretty bad, but there's a lot of scientists that uh, are really coming together to try to find ways to save coral reefs. So I don't wanna end on a hopeless message, I'm going to give you a hopeful message about what we have to do. But pretty much in 2016, I think this was a really good theme song for how we all felt. So how do we do that? How do we increase the odds? Okay, here's time on this axis. Here's the percent of reefs that bleach two times per decade. Okay, that's pretty often, it's probably too often for them to survive. This is just a schematic, it's dem just a demonstration, but basically it shows two scenarios. The main thing we have to do is to reduce CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, because that is the root cause of global warming and the root cause of what's causing these corals to bleach. So if we just keep going on the path we're going with no CO2 mitigation or too little of it, then we're gonna follow this yellow path. If we do something about it, if we follow the Paris Agreement, then we're gonna buy a lot of time by really slowing that rate of global warming. Okay, we may approach, we could approach uh, pretty high levels, but we're not gonna lose everything. And then the other part that's amazing, remember I told you these corals evolved 240, you know, million years ago, is they have capacity to adapt. They have adapted over time to many big changes in the Earth system. But right now, they just can't adapt fast enough, right? So if we look at adaptation here, if we do this too fast, we don't have time to pull this down. Uh, they, they don't have time to naturally adapt. If we actually slow this down, take this this better route, then somewhere in here, and this is just a guess, we will be able to help these corals adapt much faster. Okay? That's the whole point of what, we, what we're trying to do. So it's pretty clear that coral reefs are not just going to sit there and take it. They're not going to make it on their own. So if we look at climate change, again, on this bottom axis here, let's see if I can get my pointer to work. Um, we have climate change on this axis here, here, and we have the level of intervention. So now we're going to have to get into these systems and, and do some work with them to make them uh, stick around. If we have really low exposure to climate change and we don't have to do anything, these two things we've been doing already, okay? We've already been doing protecting species, we've already been putting in marine protected areas, but 
we also are approaching this period here where we're close to one degree centigrade already above what they want to handle and we're moving towards this range in here. So this is the range of action where we really need to start doing things. One is called reef restoration. This is not simply conservation. This is actually going in and growing corals and planting them back out on the reef and I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. If we can do this, we can start implementing things like assisted evolution. We can speed up the rate at which they adapt. We can start moving them around. We can uh, migrate them to areas which are more amenable. Uh, if we can't do that, then the only place we're going to save corals are places like here in the New England Aquarium, places on land that are not in the ocean. So we don't want to go there. We want to work in this zone right here and to really find ways to get those corals to be more resilient. So there's been, just yesterday, the second of two reports came out. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences uh, pulled together a bunch of scientists and said, what the heck are we gonna do for the corals? What kind of actions can we take to make them more resilient, if anything? And one of the, the main conclusions sort of echoes what I was talking about. We have to reduce CO2 emissions. That is, a, that is a must. If we don't, then there's hardly anything we can do to save coral reefs and probably many other ecosystems. We need to continue what we're already doing to reduce all those other stressors on reefs, control pollution, control uh, too much overfishing, that sort of thing. And now we're moving into this area, intervening with the corals itself, with its biology and its ecology it's actually leading to a lot of really interesting uh, science. So I'm gonna talk about reef restoration because that sort of forms the basis for doing all this work, okay? Think about reforestation. We're basically trying to do the same thing. We're trying to grow corals the same way we grow trees and then plant them back out into their environment, okay? That's we just haven't done that before. It's new to us, and we're learning a lot on how to do it. So here's just some examples of reef restoration, some photos to show you what it looks like. Sometimes you just take little disks, you break a coral off, you super glue it. We literally use super glue onto the disk, and then it grows and grows if you, put, if you give it the right conditions. Um, and then often we hang them suspended in the environment on something called these coral trees that was developed by Ken Niedemeyer in, in uh, Florida. And this has been a very successful way of growing corals. They seem to love it. So um, there's been a lot of coral restoration in the Caribbean by the black dots. I'm gonna talk about the work that we've done in Costa Rica. You can see there's no projects shown here on the Pacific side. There's a few people doing some work and we're networking with them to do it. But we've started probably the first major project down here in Costa Rica to work with these corals that are really tough. So the third thing, the third point here, is we're not just propagating corals, we're propagating hope. This is an incredibly effective way to get people involved and encouraged about some of the things we can do uh, with reef restoration and keeping these corals around. I have a great team, a very small team. We started this project um, almost three years ago, and we've had a, a lot of mistakes. <laughs> we're working with corals that uh, others haven't worked with, and, but we've learned a lot, and we're, we feel very successful, very privileged to be successful. So this is the beautiful environment we work in. You can see some of the coral reefs in here. This is the part of Costa Rica where we're working. These reefs are not that great. I would not tell people, oh, you need to do a scubing scuba diving vacation down there. There's only about 10 species that we're even working with, right? Whereas in Indonesia, there's, there are hundreds of species, 500, 600 species alone, in, in sometimes in just one area to work with. But, you know, it's simpler. <laughs> we don't have to worry about all those other species. We just have to worry about these key species. And they support a lot of biodiversity, so they function just like any other reef. So the problem here is that 
we were having to learn a lot because we were the first project in the eastern tropical Pacific. This is what the healthy, one of the major corals there, this is what the healthy one looks like, and this is what I found when I went down on my sabbatical to start the project. I'm like, oh great, picked a great year to do my sabbatical, right? So all the corals were bleached, actually. I wasn't really feeling sorry for myself, but really felt sorry for these corals because they, they, they suffered. They were like this, though. Remember I said if, if, they are, if they're severely bleached, they usually don't last that long. These guys lasted for over three months in this state. So that was a key to me, that these corals are super tough. There is a good reason why we should be working with these corals, because if they're tough, they could be key for future corals because they're naturally resilient. So we want to work with these mainly for that reason, and we call them corals of the hood. <laughs> they're just tough. So these are some of the species we work with. We work with about six or seven. Sometimes we don't even know what the species is. But uh, this is a branching coral, and we just suspend it with monofilament. It loves it. When we started with this coral, we couldn't even find it. It was, I was so depressed because it used to be abundant. And then probably sedimentation around you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s, before they stopped deforestation there, sedimentation probably smothered these corals. So it was hard to find them. We found little bitty pieces living on the bottom. And they were pale and, and not very healthy at all. And we put them in the nursery and they ended up like this. We were shocked. So we now have more of that species in our nursery than we've ever found through the entire searching in the Gulf. So we propagated this guy, this, this particular species, like crazy. We also propagating crusting species. This is what they look like when they're, they're glued onto the disks. And then this mass of species, parietes. This one is the hardest one to grow. It's the most common. It's tough as nails once it gets big, but it's really hard to get growing, and we think we know why. Um, but at first, we had a hard time getting it to grow. And that's just how we track their growth. We just use uh, photographs, and we use uh, image J analysis just to, to calculate the area change from month to month. We've got many thousands of photos. And this is what our nurseries look like. So this is looking down on top of the nursery. We have to protect these from triggerfish. Um, they're nasty. They <laughs> You guys probably know that in the aquarium. They like to bite. They got teeth and they like to bite, okay? So this, when we didn't have these protected, they chewed every one of them off. It must just look like a chocolate chip or something. I, I don't know why they do that. Um, and then this is our other um, nursery, looks like that. So we have also these coral line nurseries. We also like, just like clothes lines, and we string lines through here and we put the corals uh, onto the line, and they, they really grow like crazy, and we really wanted to be all natural. The students I work with are super natural. They don't want any plastic in the ocean, and I totally agree with them. So we put in hemp, and after two months, all our corals ended up on the bottom. So we had to go back to plastic, but look at this. This is how we do it. We just open the twist. We stick the little fragment in. You can see it's pretty small, and then in two months, they look like this. That's how fast they grow, and it's growing right over the line, all those polyps. So they, they love the nursery. I don't think they want to be planted. So we've had made a lot of progress. We have eight structures in the nursery. And this is just with really three people working. It's a lot of work. Uh, we have about 800 coral fragments so far. We've outplanted about 100. And we have really low mortality, except for that most, more, most common species. And basically, this is just an underwater laboratory. So you can see our structures here. You can't see the line nursery. It's back here. This is a platform we put in. We thought that's the most common way to grow corals. Um, but it got dirty really quickly, and we abandoned it. But now it's great because it's a workbench. We put all our tools up there and all this stuff. And it also uh, attracted a couple of um, angelfish that claimed it as their own. And I'll show you pictures of those, those later. So here's the progress we've made. You can see these things are really growing. Um, and there's lots of different techniques we're trying. I love this picture because this is when we first started the nursery, and you can see there's nothing living around there except this little fish here. And it was so cute. When I was taking that picture, I noticed I blew him up because he's just really watching her, and we find that a lot. These fish, just one little fish is spinning, and he's just like, just watching, you know, what are you doing? 
And pretty soon, we end up with just a lot of species colonizing these corals as they grow. This was a surprise to us. So we're not just growing corals, we're creating habitat, even in the nursery, for many different critters. And they're all doing their thing. And a lot of these things, we had a guy doing his masters, and he's trying to get um, uh, work with these corals and do an experiment by taking out all the little critters, and he couldn't. He's having to redesign his whole experiment because they are so designed to stay within those corals, and they actually protect the corals by living inside them. So we're, we're really pleased with a lot of the, the diversity that we're uh, increasing already. Now these are our two pet angelfish. They've been with us the whole time. They started out about this big, this is the Cortez angelfish. So he is called Cortez and she is called Angel. And they help us clean. They wait for us to take those cages off and they go in and I mean, they are just, they come right up to you and they're like, open, open the damn cage. <laughs> so, you know, and they follow us. They follow us everywhere. So <laughs> it's really kind of endearing to be connected with these other creatures. Uh, on the reef and for so long. And we also work a lot with humans. So we know we can never be successful unless we get the local community associated with us. And so this is Tatiana with a basket of corals we're gonna take out planting, but she also did her master's thesis working with the local community to find out what do they know about the reefs? How do they use the reefs? Do they care? Do they want to be involved? Works a lot with the kids. This is another student that um, uh, the other part of our team, uh, Jose Andres, he's showing the president and the first lady and the vice minister of the environment the corals that he's experimenting with in an on-land system. Um, so it's, uh, it's really been a super powerful way to communicate to communities about what we're trying to do and why it's important, and it just opens the doors because people want to be involved with something that's positive. So as I mentioned before, coral reefs won't make it on their own. Um, we can grow corals better underwater than we've ever known how to do before. But can we grow a better coral? Because if we just keep growing the same corals, if we just clone the same corals, it's going to be a problem because they're still not going to be able to survive climate change. So we have to stay ahead of the game. And how do we do that? So as I mentioned earlier, the National Academy of Sciences uh, put out a report on how to do it, and they looked at several big categories. What can we do genetically and reproductively? What can we do physiologically with the corals? How do we change coral populations, and, and how do we work with them to make them more resilient? And then are there anything we can do? Is there anything we can do environmentally to make the water cooler or to shade the corals from the sun during these events? So just some examples of what people are experimenting with and learning how to do is something called managed selection. That's kind of what we're doing. We're picking corals in our own nursery that have survived and ones that look good. Um, whoops. We can do uh, selective breeding of corals so you can breed them and get, keep your genetic diversity up and pick the ones that are winners. Um, you can do genetic manipulation. You can seed with coral larvae. There's a lot of things you can do. Uh, this is an example of a, what we call assisted evolution. So this is a, a coral that's spawning. This is the sperm being released by a male colony. And in a minute, you'll see the eggs being released by a, a female colony. Um, and over here on this side, you'll see that a person is collecting those eggs and sperm. So they take them into the lab, and they can increase the rate of fertilization produce more larvae, and then put them out on the reef and do like we do with seeds. If you collect seeds, you can grow a whole field of corn. If you let corn just do it naturally, it's much less, right? So this is just a um, kind of a natural way to do those things, enhance their, their natural uh, reproductive power. So this is a physiological in, uh, intervention. So one thing people are doing, they're trying to swap out these algae with another species of algae that's, that works better with the coral at high temperatures. So that's one uh, type of thing that people are doing. Sometimes you can give corals more food to eat 
and they can survive better under stressful conditions. That's probably one of the things that happened with our corals and why they could survive so long. Is there was probably food in the water. And then trying antibiotics, antioxidants, same things we do. These guys have a microbiome just like we do, right? How do you take advantage of that and make it tougher? Then also uh, coral population and community interventions. One of the things you can do is you can take a coral from somewhere else that's warmer than this reef is. You plop it in there, same species. And once it reproduces, it can spread its more heat resilient genes into the population. That's a simple way of doing that. So that's one example. And I'll speed up just a little bit. With environmental interventions, people are talking about spraying like salt water into the air that creates clouds and can shade reefs locally to protect them from the sun. If you if you shut the lights off when a coral is stressed under hot water, it's less likely to bleach. Uh, they also putting films on top of the water, experimenting with a lot of things, and then trying to pump cooler water from somewhere else onto a reef. You can only do most of these things at pretty small scale. It's, it's pretty hard to do, but it may be worth it in some cases. So I'm going to close pretty much here by just summarizing what I said. You know, how do you how do you fall in love with a coral enough to keep it around? How do we keep these things around on the planet, these magnificent features we call coral reefs? One, open your eyes to the beauty of the oceans. Just, just enjoy it. They are in, the oceans are incredible in general. Educate yourself about the problems. And be a positive force in any ecosystem. When you engage in any ecosystem and have your eyes open, as to what, these, what interactions are happening between those organisms and between yourself and these organisms. It's very powerful. We call our project the Human Coral Symbiosis Project because we've never been part of coral reefs. We've had a horrible reputation of being bad for coral reefs. And when you get in and restore it, it is our chance to be a good force for coral reefs. And I think that's a really powerful message for people to hear and to engage in. And so I'm going to close with a big thank you to a lot of the people that supported our project. Um, if you want to find out more information, you can go to our Raising Coral website. But I'm also going to finish with this, while we, I take questions, with this uh, short uh, clip of a documentary that was made about our project, just so you can see what was the kind of stuff that people do when we're out there. Okay, I think that's plenty of time for me to talk. What's the rate of growth of a typical coral? You want to answer? No, no, you go. You probably you know go. as much as I do. It depends on the coral. But like these branching corals, we start off with a piece that's about you know, half the size of my thumb, or maybe my thumb. And in about six months, it's about the size of my fist. In a year, it's about this big. We have some that we're keeping in our nursery because we want them to start uh, producing eggs and sperm is about this big after two and a half years. So they can grow pretty fast in those nurseries. They tend to grow a little slower on the reef itself because they have to compete with other things. They probably get less light. Um, the other corals just grow in layers and typically it's less than a centimeter a year. Although some of our babies are growing pretty fast. <laughs> The only thing I would add is I, I once did a study on a, a deep sea coral off the eastern coast of the U.S. and we were trying to figure out how fast it grew and it kind of, when I saw it, it was about the size of a head of broccoli and it was about 100 years old. It grew really slowly. And that's a deep sea coral? Yeah, yeah. That doesn't have zooxanthellae? It didn't have the zooxanthellae, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, what are the angelfish doing? Yeah, great question. The angelfish are vegetarians, uh, unlike the triggerfish. And uh, they eat sponges and algae and other, like they love, when something comes in and lays its eggs and inside one of those cages, they just slurp those up like, like a malt that's incredible. I've had these grids uh, and you know, I'll be like inspecting it and you know, Cortez will be on the other side. So I'm looking at the corals like this and he's looking at the corals on the other side like this. Then I flip it over for him and he, he basically just pulls off anything that looks tasty to them. On the grid. On the grid, yeah. Not on the, the coral. 
Well, they'll pull it right off the coral if it's growing on top of the coral, which is a good thing because that removes these invaders which are smothering the coral. Yes? Where, where are you located in Costa Rica? Where in Costa Rica? <laughs> it's on the um, Pacific side, but close to Panama, off of the Osa Peninsula. So how does the fluorescence happen with the corals? That's a really good question. <coughs> the fluorescence, they're fluorescent proteins that they produce when they're stressed, <coughs> and there's, they're not sure why they do it. It's, it's pretty beautiful, <laughs> but they're not sure whether it's, if they're producing it as a sunscreen. They've lost their algae, so now they're susceptible to the sun. So it could be sunscreen. It could be uh, just antioxidants, just to, to um, prevent the um, buildup of free radicals, which are bad for them. Some people think, uh, there's been two, uh, several studies, that it actually attracts the little um, critters in the water column that they can then feed on. So maybe they can start feeding and that saves them. Um, but the, the last thing is they feel like, the, people have shown that when they fluoresce, the zooxanthellae that are living in the water column are attracted to them, and so they are able to get their zooxanthellae back faster. They don't always fluoresce, but uh, when they do, it's pretty spectacular. It's pretty, that was a great question. What kind of genetic manipulations do you do? You do? So there's not been like genetic, uh, I mean, some people are looking at genetic engineering, and they're looking at CRISPR and all of these other things to try to make the corals better. Uh, that's totally like in the lab, experimental. It's not, not being done in the ocean. Um, what most of the genetic manipulations are doing through crossbreeding and that sort of thing. So just sort of watching which corals are doing better, cross them and see what happens with the offspring. offspring. Uh, do they inherit some of this resilience? But I think in the future, people will look at either genetic manipulations of the algae or of the um, of the coral itself, but one of the big things with this National Academy of Science report is to, if we're going to do these things, we have to get started now because we have to assess the risk before we deploy any of those things in the ocean. So it's the same stuff we do with plants on land, it's just in the ocean. So, so yeah, so how do you pull back and take a look at not just the big environmental picture, but how humans are operating? and you know, is, is, is capitalism consistent with really maintaining kind of a relationship with the planet? Um, there's, a, there's a book by Naomi Klein called This Changes Everything, which um, is kind of a dense book, but kind of that's, that's one of her, her points is that growth capitalism, how does, that really, how does that really work on a finite planet? Yeah, I think it's a change in our value system that's important. And uh, for me, working as a scientist always talking to people about how bad things are going to get, that has not worked. What happens is getting inside them and, and, and encouraging them to, to value nature and to, to feel it, right? I hate, I don't sound like a scientist right now, but that's very true. It's, it's got to be more of a social change and an attitude change. And I actually see this a lot in younger people, <laughs> a lot. I mean, they value vacation over salaries and they value time off and they value nature in ways that I didn't even have around me when I was growing up. So I think there is a sort of a change happening. It's just how do we encourage that to go faster? What can we do to help make changes? Yeah. You're the king of that. Well, I'll let you start. <laughs> I can add. <laughs> I think the, the um, for me, is educating yourself talking about it with people in, in ways that are not combative, just encouraging people to, to learn, getting excited about it. That's one of the most contagious things you can do. Uh, and being hopeful and, and, and coming up with solutions rather than complaining about the problem. That that's been the biggest change I've seen in my career, is doing something like this has opened up the door to conversation and say, Come with me, let's try to do this, let's make things better. Let's give people a vision of a better planet, of a better ecosystem, instead of just telling them it's bad. If we can do that, that's super powerful because then people will aim for that vision. They want it, they're hungry for it. And I get way too many emails every day volunteering for this little tiny project that I'm working on and I don't even know how they find out about it. 
<laughs> so that just tells you how much people want to change if we give them the opportunities to do that. Well, well said, well said. So the first question was, what kind of tools do you use for coastal modeling? And second is, how do you respond to a climate skeptic who says, I don't believe that the coral bleaching followed the temperature increase? Mm -hmm. The first question is that we primarily um, are using um, the regional ocean model system. Uh, started out with five kilometer resolution for the coral triangle region and now uh, one of them a really brilliant physical oceanographer that I'm working with at NCAR, Scott Bachman, is, is um, developing a really cool tool at 500 meter resolution where we're starting to see these places where things like internal waves that, f that move through the ocean due to, due to tides impacting bathymetry, they cause cold water to slosh up on some reefs. Uh, so some reefs do s tend to survive, it's just small scale, and we're trying to identify those through this technique. It's really fun, but it's a lot of computing time <laughs> to do that. The second question... Was was how do you respond to uh, someone who's skeptical you know, about uh, I just quit responding to skeptics. So, you know, you can say things a hundred times the same thing, and it's going to be the truth, and it's going to be a fact. What I've done is just ignore them, because they're only like 10% of the population or less. We have the whole rest of the people we need to care about and speak to them in ways that are meaningful. If you're always trying to answer to the skeptics, I think you're just wasting your time because they're not being a skeptic because they want you to change their mind. They're just being a skeptic. And someday maybe those people will flip, but I have not seen very many flip. So what, what triggers coral spawning? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's seasonal, lunar? Most, like this mass coral spawning, right? This is an amazing thing if you ever have a chance to do it, right? You go out to a reef and like, it'll, it depends on where you are, because they do follow the lunar cycles, they do follow the temperature cycles. But say, it, like in the Caribbean, it's like it's the second or third day after the first new moon in September, right? And you go, and then then there'll be some more two weeks later, whatever. But that's the big event, and you go out and you're you're waiting and waiting for these corals to see if they're going to start popping out these eggs. And what's remarkable is the whole community of animals on that reef knows it's knows that it's about to happen. So you see these weird worms and stuff come out. You're like, I've never seen that before. I mean, things come out because they know it's going to happen. And so they're responding to a lot of different things. And, and, and um, it's pretty cool. It smells kind of bad, but, it's <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of it's really cool. All right, uh, last question over, over here. So how far away is the nursery from the actual reef, and is it different conditions? That's a really good question. Um, it's not that far. Um, we can't swim with the corals to the reef. We have to get in a boat with them. Uh, but, but the environment's very similar, particularly the temperature environment, and that's important. So we have uh, autonomous uh, underwater temperature sensors in both our reef locations, in our uh, nurseries, and then at our outplant sites. And some are a little cooler. There may be a little bit of a difference, but they're very similar. And, and that's something that you, you want to track. You don't want to shock a coral by putting it somewhere where the, the environment's very different. Uh, we try to track a few other things too, but that's the main thing we're tracking. That's a great question. All right, well, thank you so thank much you. all for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure.